Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowman, back with another awesome video. I hope we just, well, we didn't finish the 100 Years War. I believe there's one more episode to come out, which I'll definitely get to when it does, uh, when it flops, when it lands, when it hits, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so, yeah, that's that. Hopefully, it will be out soon. But in the meantime, I'm doing Rise of the Incan Empire. Well, it's not. Or the playlist is actually called pre-columbian civilizations but the maya and the you know the inca and all that stuff that that stuff's always kind of like uh i've always been interested in that stuff you know and always want to kind of like dive in deeper and see what it's all about so that's what i'm going to start doing right now uh but if the hundred years war the final does drop i will stop doing this and get that one uh go ahead and do that one just why you know it's the hundred because hundred years will be fresh in my head and i just want to do it while you know it is fresh in my head right so uh yeah we're gonna do that all that fun stuff anyways guys please hit that like and subscribe button below uh not sure what to expect if this is just a little documentary or we're gonna be following people or not uh i really don't know uh, i'm hoping for a pleasant surprise here we'll soon find out but anyways guys yeah like subscribe all that good stuff and we will jump into the video rise of the Incan Empire. So how long ago was this started? Like, it had to be like, I don't know. Like, really, like, it's like this around the time of, like, you know, the pyramids, Egyptian pyramids came around. Is that the same time period or something? I don't know. Three, two, one. Anyways. On the edge of Western South America, wedged between Earth's driest desert, largest rainforest, and second highest mountain range, lay a sprawling empire. The Inca, through ingenious engineering and strict central planning, forged one of the world's most unusual empires. It was the largest empire in the pre Columbian Americas. Without a written language, the wheel, or money, and one of the only empires to stretch upwards rather than across. In this video, we will look at how the Inca rose to power from unknown origins and dominated their region. Yeah, this will be super interesting because, like, obviously, you know about Rome and all that stuff and the history there, but I really don't know nothing about the history, you know, in South America, the Inca, the Maya, and as well known, I mean, I think. Uh, everyone, if, if you're new to it, if you're watching this for the first time with me, let me know in the comments you know, if, you've, if you've heard of the Inca and the Maya. You know, you just heard of them, you know, uh, but don't really know nothing about them because it'd be kind of cool to know if you're kind of on the same page as me. But yeah, this would be super interesting. So no no wheel. They grew, you know, north and south. Uh, yeah, wow. That's crazy. And yeah, no wheel and stuff. And they, uh, they, have, they have those cool, like, pyramids, man. This didn't get good. When Columbus arrived in the Americas in 1492, he was unaware that about 2,000 kilometers away lay a bustling empire of 2 million square kilometers. Wow. Tahuantinsuyu, the land of the four quarters as the... Okay, so this wasn't as far back as I was expecting. Okay. Tahuantinsuyu, the land of the four quarters, as the Inca called their realm, included parts of modern Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. It had a population of more than 10 million across innumerable ethnic groups and languages. Wow. The Inca developed in near isolation, so their culture was missing many things that were vital in the old world. The wheel was absent, along with any draft animal capable of pulling weight. True. Steel and iron were... Because they had the llama, though, because I remember from you know, Geography Now videos, they did have the llama, but the llama can't pull nothing. You can't even ride on a llama. So, yeah, they didn't really have anything to kind of pull something with a wheel. So, I guess that the wheel wasn't really uh, something they could really use. I mean, I guess you could. You can make a wheelbarrow on a right? <laughs> I don't know. Along with any draft animal capable of pulling weight. Steel and iron were unknown, while gold, silver and bronze were masterfully worked. 
Most intriguing was that they lacked a written language, so their knowledge was passed on orally or through a unique system of knots called kipu. These knots were used to collect data, keep records, measure taxes, and record the census. So I guess that's probably why I don't know, really know. Well, maybe I do know a whole lot, but I don't. You never hear any stories about heroes and stuff. I guess from the Maya and Inca, you know, you just kind of know that there's a civilization. And it makes sense that they have no language. They're, you know, you can't like hier hieroglyphics that are on the wall, like, you know, for Egyptians and stuff like that. Obviously, you know, we know back to like the Romans because everything got written down. There's nothing written down. So there's no really cool stories to tell from this area. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, they might tell us, but, you know, I don't, I don't think they're going to dive into like certain heroes because how are they going to do that if they didn't really write something down? I don't know. However, as the Spanish established control over the Inca, the ability to read Kipu faded away, and the records are now indecipherable to us. Oh, yeah. Therefore, most of the history we have about the Inca has come down to us through Spanish historians or oral traditions. With that in mind, let's take a look at the origins of the Inca Empire. Okay, let's do it. Ancient Peru was one of the ancient cradles of civilization and between 8,000 and 3,000 BC, the people there domesticated llamas and alpacas along with an immense variety of crops such as potatoes, corn, beans, peanuts, squashes and quinoa. From these early agricultural societies, a series of complex cultures emerged such as Tiwanaku, Wari and Chimu. By 900 AD, States like Tiwanaku were erecting huge stone structures, building highways and canals, and maintaining a capital of 50,000 people at a time when London had around 30,000, all at 3,000 meters above sea level. The Inca were the final great society to emerge here, and inherited much from those that came before. As the Chimu Empire was at its peak, to its south, the tiny kingdom of Cuzco slumbered. This small kingdom would rapidly transform into Tawentinsuyu, or what we call the Inca Empire. Wow. Where exactly did the Inca come from? Well, let's take a look at the Inca's own mythological origin story. It begins with the great creator god Viracocha, who came upon three caves. From the central cave, Viracocha brought forth four brothers and four sisters. These were to be the founders of the Inca civilization. Out of the side caves stepped others, who were to be the forebayers of the other, less important Inca clans. One of the brothers, Ayamanco, armed with a golden staff capable of testing soil, led his people on an exodus-like journey, at the end of which he was the only remaining brother. Upon entering the valley of Cusco, the golden staff sank into the ground, and so his people settled there. The city of Cusco was founded, and Ayamanco adopted the name Manco Capac. This is one of the many origin myths of the Inca. The myth would be regularly changed and updated for political reasons. For example, if the Inca wanted to integrate a foreign state or power into their empire, then that entity would conveniently find itself wedged into the current mythology. But Manco Capac was probably a real person, yeah, typical, uh, typical, typical politics, right? Uh, but wow, but the, this is not like, I guess, 100% stuff. I guess not a lot of our history is 100%, but there's not a lot written down here. It's more myth, pretty much, right? Uh, yeah, interesting story, though. At least we're getting, we're getting some stories, though. So I'm, I'm definitely excited about that. Do the current awesome. mythology. But Manco Capac was probably a real person that led a group of nomads into the valley and founded Cuzco in the early 13th century. The history of the first eight Inca... The 13th century. See, I, I had no clue when this all started. Uh, so I was expecting you like before, you know, BC time period, you know. So I'm definitely wrong. It was definitely more recent, obviously. So uh, a lot of stuff we know from are from the Spanish. That's, that's definitely interesting kings is lost in the mists of time. Its ninth king was the first to step into certain history. Wow, a lot of kings. An Inca Alexander the Great, called Kusi Yapanqui, rose to power in the early 1400s. At the time of his birth, the kingdom of Cusco was barely more than a chiefdom. 
He was not the first in line to the throne, but after Cusco was besieged by 40,000 enemy Chanka soldiers and what? his king father and prince brother fled the city, it was Cusiyupanqui who organized a defense and not only saved the city, but also won himself the crown. Before his reign, his kingdom held the small territory around Cusco, but within a single lifetime, he and his son had stretched the new empire from present-day Bolivia to Ecuador. He adopted the name Pachacuti, which means Earthshaker, or he who turns the world upside down. Through the It's kind of crazy how like, that big pier, because they didn't have like horses and buggies and you know, stuff like that, so it... But I guess they have the coast, right? I guess that's kind of why they went up and down instead of left and right, because, you know, you just use boats, you know, and it's, you know, that's to be a lot faster than walking or possibly, you know, using horses and stuff. So I guess that's kind of why, because you think that the best of big kingdom back in those days without, you know, horses, you know, being be able to communicate, you know, very quickly. But I guess, you know, the same kind of issues, I guess, back in, I don't know, other kind of civilizations. So I don't know what I'm talking about. But anyways, yeah. The use of spies, Pachacuti would assess the military strength and wealth of the other states in the region. After collecting this information, he would send messages to the leaders of these states, attempting to persuade them to join his empire. He promised they would keep their position and would grow even more powerful. Luxury goods and riches would be poured upon them, only, however, if they submitted peacefully. If they accepted, the heirs of that ruler would be sent to the royal court in Cusco, whereupon they would be educated in an Inca fashion and raised to be perfect Incas. Nice. Once transformed, they were then sent back to rule their realms in a thoroughly Inca style. If they did not accept, they were usually crushed by the huge multi-ethnic army Pachacuti built. Wow, well, that's interesting, like, you know... You have something really to kind of look forward to. You can go there, you'll probably learn a lot, get back and meet your, probably meet your own civilization that you came from, your own town. You're probably making it a whole lot better with this new knowledge you get. So, I mean, it just definitely makes sense for everyone to go along with it. I'm, I'm sure there is definitely some that, you know, didn't, wanted to do their own thing and didn't want the influence, you know, from from them. But, you know, they all seem, it seemed like a cool system. Wow. Impressed. Pachacuti reorganized the Kingdom of Cusco into Tahuantinsuyu using a federalist system. He split the empire into four parts, or suyus, each managed by provincial governors that reported directly to the central government in Cusco. Nice. Cusco was transformed into a suitable imperial city and center to Pachacuti's new empire. The city was paved with perfectly cut stone, and from its center spread vast highways linking all the Suyus. Along with these highway projects, Pachacuti also initiated the construction of huge royal estates, the most famous of which is Machu Picchu, located 2,430 meters above sea level. The rapid growth of the empire was incredible, and even more impressive was the idea that the Inca actually tried to integrate the conquered peoples into their empire, rather than just setting up mostly independent tributary states like the Aztecs had done. I like so much like the Romans that, uh, like eventually, like kind of the Romans kind of immigrated, you know, their colonies or whatever, kind of into their civilization instead of just using them as like you know their friends or allies or whatnot, they actually made them part of Rome kind of thing, you know? I guess similar kind of thing, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> By the time Pachacuti's grandson, Huena Capac, sat on the throne, there was hardly anything else left to possibly conquer. Militarily, the Inca were extremely organized and used a flexible decimal system to organize units. They could raise armies of hundreds of thousands of soldiers and move them across rough terrain with ease. Almost all able-bodied men between 25 and 50 had military training. Each province would send men to join a military campaign whenever needed. The state made sure that no province was sending more men than they could, and on particularly long campaigns, men were regularly allowed to return home to make sure their lives did not fall out of order. Like the Aztecs, the Inca relied on cotton armor. 
They wore thick alpaca wool tunics and helmets to protect themselves. These tunics were so effective at stopping arrows that Spanish soldiers adopted them while fighting the Inca, and there are reports of them leaving battles looking like porcupines with dozens of arrows wedged in their armor. Wow. A large shield made of hardwood imported from their jungle provinces was kept on their back. Another That's crazy. That stuff stopped arrows? Wow. Oh, damn. Another, much smaller shield made of lighter wood was kept on the arm. A small cape attached to it could be used to protect their legs from missiles. As the empire was so diverse... How did it stop that? It's not like it's... You know, the same stuff we, they use today to stop bullets. I mean, how does that cloth stop an arrow? Like, you think an arrow will go right through that? Is it the, the thickness of it? That's, that's crazy. They relied on an equally diverse range of weapons and soldiers. Men recruited from the jungle provinces were excellent bowmen, while those from the other provinces preferred dart throwers and slings. For melee combat, the Inca had a varied arsenal. Spears, axes, clubs, star-headed maces, and halberds were the most common weapons and could be made from stone, bronze, or bone. Wow, like no swords? Wow. The Inca were talented with bowlers, which were multiple stones tied together that wrapped around an enemy's legs. These would be used effectively against the Spanish cavalry. The Inca used their military to expand their reach across the spine of South America, crushing resistance wherever it showed its head. In less than 100 years, they created the greatest empire in the Americas. It's kind of like, did they have a, like, because, you know, like, I, I can keep referring back to like, kind of like the Romans, you know, they had. They had their rivals, you know, because you had like the Punic Wars and stuff. I'm sure that they had, had to have, you know, their own kind of rivals, right? Like maybe it's just not documented or like they just, the rivals didn't, they, they stopped the rivals from getting big enough to really have any kind of effect on them. So they really didn't have any rivals because they stopped it right at the beginning. But how did they keep it all functioning? And how did they keep 10 million mouths fed in a land of extremes? We will cover that in the next episode. Thank you for watching this video in our series on the pre-Columbian civilizations. Well, the next episode will video in our series. Inca Sling could break a sword in two pieces and kill a horse. What? Because they did have swords. I'm sorry, I missed that. Wow. A sling can do that? Wow. The... Oh, you know? He's on the pre-Columbian civilization. During the Spanish conquest, the Inca adopted Spanish technology and tactics. With Spanish swords, shields, and helmets, and every Indian armed in this way, charged on horseback. The Inca appeared on horseback among his people with his lance in his hand. Wow. So, like, if they're the only ones with this technology, if anyone rose up against them, probably don't have this technology. So... Yeah, they they have an advantage of numbers and, and just technology. So wow, there there's no one gonna stand against them. I'm guessing, like you know, any other kind of civilization, like what happened to? I mean, you get a bad, probably just you, they're gonna end up getting like a bad king when he's not, and it's just things are just gonna, you know, fall apart or another power rises up and kind of takes part of them out. This will be interesting. It's kind of cool how we get to learn more here. But anyways, guys, what do you guys think? I think it was pretty impressive. I didn't really know about the no wheels and stuff and i didn't realize how recent this kind of thing was i mean it's not recent but you know you know what i'm saying uh so yeah definitely really interesting stuff i'm definitely uh excuse me i'm interested to see how like more battles come in uh, the play and uh what other kind of people i don't know i'm just gonna kind of you like whatever you know just when like different outsiders come in, like how it affects the, the people there and, you know, just the kingdom and all that, you know, and see how, you know, how the kingdom stands up against the Spanish and, and whatnot, whatever. I can't think of my words. Anyways, guys, hit that like and subscribe button. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I really did. I hope you guys continue the journey on with me through this because I definitely want to learn this and definitely let me know in the comments if you have you know, 
a new uh, 100 Years War episode drops. So I definitely want to get to that. But anyways, guys, appreciate you guys watching. Peace. And catch you guys in future videos. I am out. Bye.